Welcome back to the Almost Shameless podcast. I am your host, Tanya Ray Fox. Thank you for joining me. I am so excited for today's show. A lot of times I don't do entirely Patriots podcasts because it is more of an NFL show. I do a lot of Patriots coverage for obvious reasons, but today is an all Patriots podcast. So I'm excited. We are doing mid-season awards. We are through week nine. There is no exact game halfway point now that there are 17 games, but it is week nine. It is an 18 week season technically. So we're halfway through and I'm really excited to do this because it's a good time to be a Patriots fan. They are five and four. They are on a three game win streak. And I think it is uh, about time that we start to turn the page to the back half of the season and take a look at what is ahead. We did a little bit of that last week. I want to do sort of just celebrating where they're at at this point. The fact of the matter is the AFC seems to really want to give the Patriots and Bill Belichick a chance to make their way into the playoffs and spoil things for at least one team. So, you know, their chances of making the playoffs look brighter and brighter every single week. I tweeted that I was playing around with the New York Times playoff calculator, which is really fun. You should go try it. Um, You can just like, there's all kinds of little, like you can do one for every team. What are their chances if this happens, if that happens, if the rest of the season plays out a certain way, like what are their chances that they'll make the playoffs? And so I did that and I did it with the most sort of like realistic version of them going 10 and seven. So I had it so that they, If they lose to the Browns, win against the Falcons, lose to the Titans and at Buffalo and then win out, which would give them a 10 and seven record, they would still have 99% chance. This was before uh, Ravens Dolphins. So I don't know how that affected it, but they would still have a 99% chance to make the playoffs. So it's looking pretty good for the Patriots right now to make one of those wild card wins. There's if not potentially, and perhaps the upset of the AFC East in a long time overtake the bills for the AFC East. We are in that zone right now. So those two bills games looming ahead are really huge. The fact that they've been packed into the back half of the season, both of them is serendipitous. It's going to create a lot more drama and that's exciting. So we are going to celebrate where the Patriots are at through week nine, heading into week 10. Before I get to it, it is worth noting the Patriots did not get Odell Beckham Jr. in the big sweepstakes that happened over the last week since he was released by the Browns. And I did talk a lot about this on the Locked On Patriots podcast with Mike DeBate. So you can listen to that for a more extensive rant about that and how it all went. But let me just say, I don't think that it was a massive loss for the Patriots, if only because they just, we know how the Patriots are going to win on offense at this point. Adding someone like Odell Beckham Jr. may bring Mac along a little quicker in that deep passing game, stretching the field out and all that stuff. But I do still think that with Nelson Aguilar and some of what Kendrick Bourne can do, They can do that if that's what they really want to. We know how this offense is going to go. It's going to be conservative. And I understand why why Odell Beckham Jr. may have not seen this offense as the perfect fit for him, especially because he had just come from a place where he didn't have a great connection with the quarterback on the field. Always hard to develop that kind of real rapport with a rookie quarterback who's still figuring everything out. Who wouldn't want to go play with Matt Stafford on the Rams offense right now? So good luck to him. The Rams added their, you know, fifth infinity stone or whatever. We'll see how that goes. And of course, Cam Newton signed with the Panthers. He is the Panthers quarterback again. Um, I'm really excited that he's going to get a chance to play again. I think it's cool that he landed back in Carolina. According to some people, he had offers from other places, but this is a place where he will be able to start sooner than later. I know he's not supposed to start this Sunday, but obviously going forward, that will be the plan. That will be cool to see. We saw that he had improved over. It looked like his arm had gotten better from 2020 into the 2021 preseason strong chance. He could have stayed the Patriots starter. If he had been vaccinated, we will never know. Everyone has moved on in new England. It is the Mac Jones era, but I do think he still has a lot left in the tank. He has certainly a lot more left in the tank than a lot of random ass quarterbacks that have been signed and gotten chances to start elsewhere over the last however many decades of football. So more than deserving of a starting spot 
to fill in for injured or not working quarterbacks. And I'm excited to see how that plays out. I'm glad he will be in a place where the fans embrace him, know him, hate and love him for all that he is, was, and maybe, you know, that's kind of how it goes. So that's, it's great. I think that the NFL is always more interesting and exciting and dynamic when Cam Newton is in it. So that is cool. And the, and the third thing we should mention before we get into all of this is that the Ravens did lose a very weird game to the Dolphins on Thursday night football. So they have another loss under their belt as well. They've had a hard time winning games, three overtime games this season. Lamar Jackson has carried them throughout the season in ways that truly I would take another two, three podcasts to get through. But last night, the magic wasn't there. These Thursday night games are getting really weird. I don't know that it's a sign that the Ravens are completely falling apart, but they have kinks to work out. There's a reason that the games have been so close and they keep coming down to the wire and they keep coming down to these overtime games, last minute possessions. And they do have to figure that out. I still am very afraid of what the Ravens are capable of when they're not on a short week or dealing with these weird Thursday night games. I just, I think that we have to take every Thursday night performance with a grain of salt at this point. So we will see how much of a threat the Baltimore Ravens really are. Their division is wild. Seems like every week, another team from the NFC North is the new best team in the, in the division. And then there's a new worst team in the division. So one of those teams is going to be facing the Patriots this week. And that may determine what the, what the outcome of both divisions look like in a few days. But in the meantime, We're not doing game projections. Like I said, talked a lot about that. Talked about the game, the upcoming game, Cam, Odell, Beckham Jr., all of that on the Locked On Patriots podcast. Please listen. For now, we are celebrating nine weeks of the 2021 Patriots. Let's do it. First up, the offensive player of the year thus far for the Patriots is none other than Damian Harris. Damian Harris has been the player through which the offense really has found its rhythm Over the last three, four, five weeks, every week, the running game seems to start to get better and more in sync, and they are finding a rhythm. And we know it's been since the beginning of the season, we've talked about this, this offense is going to go as far as the run game will take them. Obviously, it didn't start out with a bang, but we can see week after week how well they're doing. And a large part of that, the biggest part of that is Damian Harris. Since week six, he has 317 yards and five touchdowns, which makes him fourth overall in rushing yards and second overall in touchdowns since week six over the last four weeks. So he's really ramping it up. He's one of the best runners in the league over the last four weeks, and that has been huge for the Patriots. But it doesn't just come down to the last four weeks. He's actually having a nine game stretch that we haven't seen from the Patriots very often. The last time that a Patriots running back had 540 plus rushing yards and seven touchdowns through nine games was in 2016 LeGarrette Blunt. We know him. We love him. Great season. That was the season that they, that they were really relying on LeGarrette Blunt because Tom Brady was out with that four game suspension. So he had a little bit of extra to carry. So it's the first time since then. And it's only been done seven times by a running back in Patriots history. And some of those running backs that have done that, Tony Collins, Sam Cunningham, the great Hall of Famer, Curtis Martin. So this is, it's only been done a couple of times in this decade. He is one of them. And prior to that, some of the, you know, the all timers that we remember from the old days. So this is a really special performance from him. And that's going to go a little under the radar because it has not been a particularly explosive offense, but in terms of what the Patriots do and the types of running back performances that they've had in franchise history, this is a really big deal. And because he's getting better and better every week, it's a sign that it can, that it, that there's a chance this gets more prolific as time goes on. Obviously the concussion issue may keep him out of the game against the Browns. And if that's the case, I'd rather have him sit out and get healthy now so that he can continue to be that offensive MVP for this team going forward. Okay, defensive MVP, this was hard because there's two players that are pretty obvious. But for the purposes of progress on that pass rush, we have to throw defensive player of the year so far to Matt Judon. Nine sacks through nine games. That's third in the league, tied for third in the league 
huge. The Patriots don't normally have sack numbers from one player like this through the through nine games of the season. So that is huge. 36 total tackles from a defensive end. You don't hate to see it. He has 16 overall QB hits and 10 tackles for a loss tied with Micah Parsons for fifth overall in the league. This is these these are top of the league, really bordering on elite, if not elite pass rushing numbers from a Patriots player. And that's something that they've been missing since the Chandler Jones days. And that, and it really has, as every week has gone by, given the Patriots defense more to work with. And we've seen the Patriots defense every week look more and more like one of those patented Belichick defenses that's going to carry this team potentially into a playoff appearance and a playoff win. If they can stay on this track, that's what they're looking at. And Matt Judon is unquestionably the most important part of that. And again, this is historic for the Patriots. There have been two players since 1982 when they started tracking sacks on the Patriots who have ever had nine sacks through nine games in the season. Chandler Jones in 2015 and Andre Tippett in 1986. That's it. So this isn't, this is again, a huge thing. The Patriots rarely get this kind of production through nine games at the edge rushing position. And, and it is obviously continuing to gel that defense in a way that's really important. One of the best free agency moves that Bill Belichick has made in a while. It's, it, it's brilliant. It's working even better than any of us could have expected. So kudos to Matt Judon. Keep doing you. I do have to say honorable mention, of course, to JC Jackson, the NFL leader in passes defense, you know, the team loses Stefan Gilmore and it, and they it's hard to feel the loss as deeply as we should because of JC Jackson. He really is elite at that position. Five interceptions already on this season. He is a menace. So we can consider them a, a dynamic duo. One pass that rushing one in the secondary. Uh, ultimately, the honor goes to Matt Judon, but it goes without saying that they really can't do everything they're doing without JC Jackson as well. Our special teams player of the year through nine games is, of course, big kick Nick Folk. Guys, this is not this is not supposed to happen. Nick Folk wasn't supposed to be this when they signed him uh, out of desperation. But here we are. And Nick Folk is one of the best kickers in the NFL. He is one of the most reliable field goal kickers in the NFL. I don't know how Bill Belichick does this. I don't know what he has his special teams group drinking in that locker room whatever it is it works it works on the kickers the punters the ret- it, it works on everybody and Nick Folk has been a hugely important piece to this team's success again when you have a conservative offense you have to have a good kicker a good field goal kicker and and that's Nick Folk he leads the league in field goals made he's made 21 of his 23 attempts that 91.3 field goals made percentage is the highest in the league among kickers with 20 plus attempts. He made two 52 yarders in one game against the Texans and his only two misses on the season were 50 plus yard attempts. So this is a guy who is perfect between zero and 49 yards this season. He is uh, kicking at a prolific rate through week nine. So the fact that he is leading the league in field goal percentage is really incredible. And he may be part of the reason why Bill Belichick has been a little bit more conservative, trying to convert on fourth downs and things like that, because there's really not anybody doing it better and more consistently than Nick Folk right now uh, from the field goal line. I would like to see him miss fewer point after attempts, but that's a weird thing that's been kind of plaguing the league for the last few years. So I'm not going to be too worried about it. If he can stay on track, stay on this pace for the rest of the season, Um, I know he's not Justin Tucker, but so far he's outperforming just about every kicker in the league from the field goal line. So that is huge. Okay. Rookie of the year drum roll. It's Mac Jones. Of course it's Mac Jones. Mac is not lighting up the stats. He hasn't, he's not looking like he's changing the future of the game. He is being a reliable game manager and he is not making a ton of huge mistakes and he is continuing to learn and grow. 
that's all you can ask from a rookie quarterback. His defense is giving him a chance to stay in games and he is making sure that he's not wasting their efforts. I love that. He's learning how to work with the run game and really rely on them. I love that. On top of that, not too shabby. He's 15th in the league in passing yards. As a rookie, that's pretty fucking good. He's only been sacked 17 times. Again, as a rookie, credit to the offensive line that's been trying really, really hard to get their shit together enough to just protect him long enough. 17 is a pretty good number for somebody who started every single game this season and and is a rookie. I'm really impressed by that. He's ninth in the league and completion percentage. Again, I think completion percentage can sometimes be a little bit overrated when it comes to really conservative short passing offenses. But for a rookie, I think you really have to take into consideration what that means. It means he's making smart throws as often as possible. And that's what you want to see. He's got a very respectable 89.8 passer rating on the season, right in that Ben Roethlisberger zone, which is like not great if you're Ben Roethlisberger and you're trying, you know, you're talking about future hall of fame and you've been to super bowls and all that stuff, but it's really good for a rookie on a team that was considered a fringe contender at best to start the season. So all overall Mac is by far the most successful and prolific rookie quarterback this season. Yes, he was drafted to a really good team with the greatest coach of all time, and he is capitalizing on that. He's not wasting that opportunity. Let's not forget, we've seen what some rookie quarterbacks have looked like in the past, even with good teams. It's not always easy to not turn the ball over. Part of what Mac understands about his limitations is what prevents him from turning the ball over at an inordinate rate and making risky throws. He is not, he does not have the talent of Andrew Luck, but he does have the smarts to understand that he's not the athlete and doesn't have the arm that someone like Andrew Luck had. So he doesn't make the amount of mistakes that Andrew Luck made in his rookie season. So there's like little things there that are really encouraging. And as the season go on, goes on, he's seen hard, tougher defenses and there have been bumps and You see his rookie moments a lot, but they seem to not rattle him. He has the support of the team and the coaching staff, and I will never blame a rookie for acting like a rookie. That's what happens, and it's simply not his fault if there are times where he seems out of his depth. That's what happens. That's why you have to build the defense that Belichick's trying to build. That's why you have to have the run game that they're trying to maintain. All the other pieces around them are set up to support Mac Jones. And he is taking an advantage of that as much as he is capable of taking advantage of that with his skill set, And that is why he is absolutely unquestionably, of course, the rookie of the year so far for the Patriots. Okay. Moving on to comeback player of the year, both figuratively and literally the great Jamie Collins. He of course, literally came back to the Patriots. Traded early on from the Lions. Things weren't working out there. Again, this is the second time that that he has returned. He was on the Patriots, was amazing. Landed with the Browns. Came back to the Patriots, was amazing. Landed with the Lions. And now he has returned. The prodigal son has returned. He is currently the highest graded pass rusher at the linebacker position by Pro Football Focus. 12th highest graded linebacker overall. And he's already doing Jamie Collins things, getting vertical. His dy- he is such a dynamic athlete, and he just fits so well with what the Patriots want to do season after season. I don't know what it is that doesn't work with other teams, but he is tailor-made for these Bill Belichick moments. And I think that when you get that opportunity to come back and be in a defense that you're familiar with and thrive, and you do it as consistently as Jamie Collins has done it, Um, without all the baggage of what that means being let, you know, you're let to go off multiple times, but you genuinely come back and believe that you can continue to make a difference and continue to prove yourself. It's a really admirable quality in a player. You know, he's sort of an enigma. There's a lot going on with Jamie, but he is the definition of a player who comes back and makes a difference. And while I am very impressed with the random bursts of excellence from the likes of Brandon Bolden, It is J.B. Collins who wins Comeback Player of the Year on the Almost Shameless podcast, Mid-Season Awards. Okay, best loss of the season. I wanted to do this because I think that we learn a lot more about teams from their losses sometimes than their wins. And the best loss from the Patriots this season 
because of when it happened, where it happened, and against whom it happened, may tell us more about what the Patriots are capable of than any of their wins. And that is their prime time loss to the Dallas Cowboys at home in week six. That night, it was already being talked about as game of the year. It is considered one of the best games of the season still so far. Two powerhouse franchises really going for it in a game that went to overtime. It's what every NFL fan wants to see. It was a thrilling game to watch and a really impressive defensive performance. I think this is the game that turned this defense into a defense that is can be considered one of the most formidable defenses by the end of the season. I think that their origin story was against the Cowboys that week. Dak Prescott was absolutely red hot playing out of his mind at that point. The Cowboys converted 25 first downs in that game compared to the Patriots nine. They possessed the ball for over 39 minutes to the Patriots 27. The Cowboys ran 82 plays. The Patriots ran 50. Uh, They put the Patriots defense through the ringer and this game still went to overtime. The Patriots goal line stand against the Cowboys in that game will remain one of the best moments of the season, regardless how things go from here. It is incredibly hard to be outperformed and outpossessed that much on offense and still have it be a one possession game at the end of the day, a game that ended in overtime. It's really impressive. You look at 35 points and you think, well, the Patriots defense blew it. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It was a really good performance. And on the other side of the ball, listen, Mac Jones couldn't necessarily hang with Dak Prescott production wise, but he did still manage 229 passing yards, you know, with uh, Micah Parsons and Trevon Diggs staring him down. Not not bad for a young man, not bad for a young man. And the Patriots outperformed them on the ground. Difference was Patriots scored two two touchdowns on the ground. And so, you know, that's a potent rushing offense. And they did a good job keeping pace with them on that front. And that also kept them in it offensively. So overall, I looked at that game and the Cowboys are definitely the best team they've played this season. When they played the Bucs, it was in the rain. They were without Gronk. So they weren't really getting the best of the Bucs. So I really think the Cowboys are the best, most complete team that they've played this season by a pretty large margin. And that's why I will remember that loss fondly because I do think it portends good things and it has continued to um, since then. It was a real turning point for them. They've been winning since that game and there are reasons why I think they got a lot of confidence from that game. And of course, the best win of the season, the best win of the season, my friends, is the next one, is the next one. Of course, come on guys, you knew, you knew it had to be. The best win of the season is gonna be the next one. Tom Brady may be gone, but he is not forgotten. Always looking to the next win, not getting caught in the trap. You know I had to end it that way, come on. So as they look forward and look ahead to these big games coming up, Browns in week 10, Titans, Bills, two games against the Bills, There is a lot to believe in with this team. The Bills have looked very, very human. Josh Allen has looked human. I still don't buy that the Titans are as good as they have looked. I just can't. There's something in there. There's some sort of crack in the armor that someone's going to find. And why not Bill? Why not the classic Bill versus Rabel showdown that's turned into one of the best coaching showdowns in the AFC. We love to see it. I'm looking forward to that game. In the meantime, let's celebrate all of our Damian Harris, offensive player of the first half, Matt Judon, defensive player of the first half, Nick Folk, special teams player of the first half, Mac Jones, rookie of the year, of the first half. I have a feeling he's going to keep that one going. Jamie Collins, comeback player of the year of the first half. All these guys are going to be the most important players on this team moving forward. So celebrate them and look forward to what they have to offer on the back half of this season. Things are so much more exciting than we ever could have hoped for the Patriots. Thank you so much for joining me on this casual Friday. I never get to do stuff like this. This was really cool to just be able to kind of fan out about the Patriots and just be excited for what's to come. Even if they do lose against the Browns, I'm really excited for what could still unfold for the rest of the season. Like I said, for more in-depth breakdown of the Browns game itself, 
the Odell Beckham signing with the Rams, Cam Newton signing with the Panthers, all of that, go to Friday's episode of the Locked On Patriots. It's Box On Fridays on Locked On Patriots with Mike DeBate, and you can listen to that as well. Thank you again for joining me, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.